You know, whenever I think of Palm Sunday, I am flooded with memories of Palm Sunday as a young kid at our old church down on Clark Avenue. You guys remember? I remember as a young, little, snot-nosed Italian kid grabbing five or six of those palms at the end and running down the hallways looking for my sisters to hit them with, you know? So if any of the kids do that today on the way out, be patient with them. They were Pastor Mike, <laughs> okay? I, you know, I didn't understand all the implications of what Palm Sunday meant, what that triumphal entry meant thousands of years ago, but I knew that this day was special. I knew that what Jesus was doing that day was saying something special about himself. That the images of the palm and of a donkey and the crowds of people praising God together, young and old, it meant something. And while I was mostly enjoying teasing my friends and sisters, I knew that I was to be part of that praise. That I was to be part of that same crowd. And I imagined myself among the revelers that day. And I think we need to do the same today in 2024. And in fact, some church traditions on Palm Sunday and various other places, do you know that it's the tradition to join each other in a march throughout your neighborhood with palms? So who is joining me after the service on Page Avenue? <laughs> ah, I see one of you. I see that hand in the balcony. Okay, they're paying attention up there. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity for us to declare together, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the truth is this morning that we need to see ourselves in the story of Palm Sunday, not just in the imagination of a playful child, but as we live in today's world, because perhaps, perhaps more than ever in today's world, a world that finds itself amidst the threats and actions of war, a world in which we may feel overwhelmed by the reality of sin and the brokenness that wars within each and every one of us, we need, perhaps more than ever, the hope that Palm Sunday brings. And if you're feeling overwhelmed this morning or burdened today, Palm Sunday is the day for you. If you're feeling overwhelmed and burdened in your personal life with decisions that need to be made, Perhaps you're saddened today as you're bearing grief and loss between those that you have loved. If you're here today and you're still looking for some answers to some of life's greatest questions, then I pray that you'll join me in saying, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I can't think of a more apropos way to start our worship in this new space than on Palm Sunday. We're praying that on Sundays in this place, we will lift up praise and glory to God. And this morning when I woke up uh, and sought God in prayer, I woke up at 4.30 today. I slept in today. Don't judge me, okay? I was in bed by like 9 o'clock, so don't worry about it, okay? I was just thinking about this amazing moment in the history of our church, and I was just praising God. And before I went through the litany of requests I have in my life, and I have a long list, I know you do as well, I spent a good five, ten minutes this morning just praising God. And if Palm Sunday is about declaring praise to the King who's coming to save us, then may it be true of us each and every day. No matter the burden, no matter the pain, no matter the struggles, we will say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, Jesus met on that first Palm Sunday thousands of years ago, hurting, broken, needy, longing people. Does anybody fill in one of those categories? And much like us, if we're honest this morning and admit it, he could show himself to be the king that is strong, the king that is mighty, the Lord that's ready to save us. Jesus, on that first Palm Sunday, kick-started the week that changed history. The week that was the fulcrum upon which all of time and space turned towards hope. And if you're here this morning, bringing your broken heart and your needs, today we declare Hosanna because there is hope. I believe that Palm Sunday should invoke at least two responses from us today. The first is celebration. Say it with me, celebration. celebration. Today we are going to celebrate the day and what that means. We're going to see from God's word. 
The second is the word contemplation. Say it with me. Contemplation. We need to think about, to consider, to reflect upon, to contemplate the doorway that this day represents. Because while Jesus entered into Jerusalem with the cheers of the people around him, he ends the week at a cross with the jeers of those around him. And as we contemplate what this day meant for Jesus in that final week of his earthly ministry, I pray that it will drive us as well this morning towards the cross, towards the hope that's found alone in him. Today we're going to see these two themes from the two primary Old Testament texts that the gospel writers reference as we think about Jesus on his Palm Sunday. So let's commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you now for your word. And Lord, we pray that it might speak truth to our hearts. Lord, we are in the midst of a distracting world, and we are overburdened by burdens, Lord, we cannot bear on our own. And so, Lord, we ask now in these brief few moments together, speak to us through your grace and through your truth, and change us from the inside out. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. The first response that Palm Sunday invokes from us is celebration. Celebrate the day. Say it with me. Celebrate the day. Remember, the nation of Israel had been longing and looking for a king for many, many years. The nation of Israel for 1,000 years had been crying out, we need a ruler. We need a king. We need a leader. You could read it in the Old Testament in the book of 1 Samuel. You know Samuel, that amazing prophet, that final judge. Remember, he's leading the nation of Israel, and he's encouraging them and guiding them as a people. And the people say, yes, yeah, Samuel, you're okay, but we would really like a what? A king, a leader, someone that we could see and touch, someone that was strong and mighty. And it says that Saul stood out because of his height and his good looks. And in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, we see God speaking to the prophet Samuel, reminding him of what the people are really looking for. He says this, but the Lord told him, listen to the people and everything they say to you. They have not rejected me. You, they have rejected me as their king. You see, the hope for the nation of Israel, the hope for us this morning, is not that we might find a leader that this world might offer but that we might look to God as our king, that we might look to the Lord himself as the true leader, the true sovereign, the true mighty and powerful one to save. And on that Palm Sunday, thousands of years ago, Jesus enters in with a fulfillment of the kind of king they really needed. In fact, the text that we quote, that we see in the scriptures often recited is in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And this is what the word of God says. He says, the rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem as the king that the people were not expecting but as the king that they truly needed. When Zechariah writes this prophecy hundreds of years after Samuel and hundreds of years prior to Jesus, he is writing to the nation when they are themselves are finding other warring nations strong and powerful amongst them. In fact, they are wondering whether or not they can survive. They're wondering whether or not their God is powerful. They're wondering whether or not God can truly do what we long for him to do. And into that, this prophecy comes. There's a king that's coming. Notice in the text, the way the king is described, there's at least three characteristics. He is righteous. He does the right, just, holy, appropriate, good things. He is humble. He comes in riding on a victorious steed, right? He comes riding in on a humble what? Donkey. And he's victorious, he brings peace. He brings victory. He's a righteous. He's a humble. 
He's a peace-bringing king. And aren't those characteristics we look for in all our leaders? I don't know if you know this. This is an election year in the U.S. Did you know that? No matter what news station you turn to, no matter what paper you read, no matter what app update you get on your phone, the election year is in full earnest. Get ready. You are about to see some of the best and worst in people in the next several months. But no matter who you align with or what your beliefs are politically, don't we all long for a leader who will do things that are righteous? Do we not long for a leader who will stand up for what will bring about peace? And isn't there something compelling about a leader who in the midst of their strength demonstrates humility? You see, we can celebrate Palm Sunday because this is the king we find in Jesus. A ruler who is righteous, peace-bringing, and humble. You see, Jesus fulfilled all the longings of a leader who will carry out his authority humbly. He did not come like the arrogant Roman generals on their war horses. No, there's joy in this righteous, humble leader who longs to bring peace. In Luke's gospel, we see him quoting this section of scripture as he talks about Palm Sunday in Luke chapter 19. In your chairs in front of you, if, if you don't have a copy of God's word with you, they're, they're underneath the chairs right in front of you for you, for you to reference. But here in verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 35 of Luke, we see him referencing this same theme of Zechariah 9. He says, then they brought it to Jesus, the donkey, and after throwing their clothes on the donkey, they helped Jesus get on it. As he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road, and now he came towards the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a voice for all the miracles they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And you know, when Jesus comes in like a king like this, you think everybody would rejoice. But we hear right away the Pharisees and the crowd say this, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered them, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would what? Cry out. The stones would celebrate. The world itself is longing for the redemption that Jesus brings. We can celebrate the day because our king came in on a humble donkey to offer us peace. G.K. Chesterton, the famous English poet and philosopher and theologian, wrote this compelling poem about that humble donkey. When fishes flew and forests walked and figs grew upon thorns, some moment when the moon was blood then surely I was born. With monstrous head and sickening cry and ears like errant wings, the devil's walking parody of all four-footed things, the tattered outlaw of the earth of ancient crooked will, starve, scourge, deride me, I am dumb. I keep my secret still. Fools, for I also had my hour, one far fierce hours and sweet, there was a shout about my ears and palms before my feet. This is the God we serve. This should cause us to celebrate. The humble king who rides in on a donkey, showing his power and might. So, you can trust this king with your life. You can trust this king with your future. You can trust this king with your family. You could trust this king with your health. You can trust this king with our nation and with our world. I have homework for you. Are you ready? Oh, man, it's Sunday and I'm giving you homework. It's the best kind of homework, okay? It's homework to reflect on the Lord. What I want you to do is go home today or on your ride home or maybe as you're going out to lunch today. I want you to take out a pen and paper. Do you still use a pen and paper? I, think, I don't think some of you do. 
All right, I use the notes app on my phone, okay? Take out whatever it is that you take your notes on, and I want you to write out, to list out the reasons why Jesus is worthy to be king. The reasons why you can trust him with your life. The reasons why you could celebrate him as that humble, righteous, peace-giving king in your life. I started out my morning this way, and it's a way we should start out every day. You need to write out why you can say, Hosanna, because he's kind, because he has forgiven us, because he is sovereign, because he is in control, because he is ever-present to us, because he provides for us, because he offers us a future, because he is alive and not dead, and we are just scratching the surface. Are you with me? Celebrate today the king that we serve. I'm convinced the reason why we often give in to brokenness and despair, why I do in my life, because I'm not celebrating Jesus enough. At my other uh, church before coming here to Gateway, we used to have a midweek prayer service that would go an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. We'd meet every Wednesday. And at this church, they would have a four-sided prayer bulletin every week with all the prayers for the church, missionaries around the world. I mean, it was like a heavy booklet we would take to prayer meeting. I mean, the list was really long. People knew that this was a praying church, and they would, they would send in via email and calls, and we would write in all these prayer requests, and man, we would get that prayer packet, and we would go to work on Wednesday nights. And I remember thinking, man, this is a long packet, you know, and it was in midtown Manhattan, and I was living in Staten Island. I'm thinking, I got to get home pretty soon, so let's, let's blast through this list, you know, real good attitude in prayer, okay? And I remember there was this one seasoned saint, I'm going to say it that way. She had been walking with Jesus for many, many years. And before we would start working our way through those four pages of prayer requests, she would make sure we spend time in praise of Jesus. We'd be going through like every one of his attributes. I knew it was, was long when she'd start with he's the alpha, and she wouldn't say omega. She would start with alpha, and then we'd go through, you know, you know and then, you know, he's the provider. You know? I mean, she would just go on and on. We would, we would pray through so many scriptures, and she was a, an amazing woman with a, a, a wonderful Jamaican accent, and she would be praying and lifting us up before God's throne in praise. And I remember thinking, man, we are never going to get to this list of prayer. <laughs> one Sunday, one Wednesday night, I said, you know, maybe we'll, we'll hit the prayer list now. You know, we've been at this for a while. And she said, we don't bring our requests until we offer up our praise. Are you with me? Don't get tired of celebrating the day, celebrating the Savior. Will you begin in your life? Secondly, the, the, the second uh, 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 invocation, if you will, or response, I'm going to figure it out. It's a new clicker, okay? Give me, give me. We need to contemplate what this doorway brings this doorway to the week ahead. That we celebrate Palm Sunday, but Palm Sunday has its ultimate significance and meaning and impact in our life because we know that it was the first step for Jesus in Jerusalem as he makes his way towards the cross. In the New Testament, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Over 35% of the Gospel material is focused in on Jesus' last week. There are so many questions we have about Jesus, aren't there? Like when he was growing up, what was it like to always be right with, with your siblings? Like, you know? I know what that was like, but I don't know. None of them are here, I hope, today. There's so many unanswered things about Jesus growing up, and the scriptures tell us that he started ministry at 30. There's so many things we think we need to know, but the gospel writers concentrate for us, yes, on his life and ministry, but 35% of their material focuses on this last week. And Palm Sunday is the beginning. It's the doorway that leads us through to the events of this Friday coming up and to a week from now as well. And the scripture that the writers in the Gospels reflect on when they think of this is in Psalm 1, 18, verse 25 and 26. It says this, Lord, Hosanna. That's what save us means. Hosanna means save us. Lord, Hosanna. Lord, please grant us success. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed from the house of of the Lord, we bless you. 
In Mark chapter 11, where Mark reflects on this scripture in Palm Sunday, he says this in verse 9, those who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted at Jesus, Hosanna, save us. Think of it. Jesus is riding in on this donkey. And they're thinking, eh, not the animal of choice I would have, but okay. And as he's riding in, they're saying, save us. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means save us. It's a prayer. It's a plea for help. It's a declaration of our need for salvation. It's a request for freedom. As the psalmist used it, we find that same meaning coming across for the Jews as they are proclaiming this, as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. But they were looking for Jesus to save them from something much different. You remember, if even the own disciples didn't understand the work that Jesus was going to, if even the own disciples were questioning why Jesus would have to go to a cross, imagine the confusion on the crowds. It's not as if when Jesus comes in on Palm Sunday, they're thinking, oh good, we know that this is leading to a cross on Friday. We know that this means we get to take up our cross and follow him. No, 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 remember, the disciples all scatter. They're looking to Jesus to come in on this Palm Sunday to save us, what? From the political oppression we find around us. Rome is in charge. And we want a political leader. Generations prior, there was such a religious or, or, or a political leader that rose up, Judas Maccabeus. And, and as he comes back triumphant from victory over the enemies of that day, they too would scream, Hosanna, as they lay down their palm branches. The palms becoming a symbol of nationalistic hope. They are looking for Jesus to save them on their terms and on their timetable. Thank God we don't come to Jesus like that anymore. Thank God we don't come to Jesus and say, Lord, I want this that way and right now. Thank God we don't come to the Lord like this and say, Lord, I want this relationship to go this way and I want it to happen yesterday. Thank God we don't come to the Lord and say, Lord, I want this job and I want this money and I want it today. <laughs> Thank God we don't come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need health and I need peace and I need finances and I need things in this way and this time. You know, we all do it all the time, don't we? We come to Jesus and we say, Lord, save now. Lord, provide now. Lord, come through now. And I know exactly how and when you should do it. And Jesus offers us something different. Jesus comes not just at the whimsies of our desires and wishes, not just with political power and advancement. Jesus comes to offer us the salvation we truly need. You see, they didn't realize it, but as they were declaring, Hosanna, save us, they were prophetically declaring what Jesus would do that week. He would save them. Not through military uprising, not through giving them the peace they wanted in political terms, but to going to where? The cross. So that through his death and resurrection, the power of sin and evil and death finally can be wiped away. Jesus did come to save on that first Palm Sunday, but he came to save us from our sins and to offer us forgiveness and purpose and life forever. Some of us are crying out to Jesus to save us from so many things and he's offering us something greater. Do you know him like this? Do you know this king not only as a triumphal leader but as the crucified son of God? Think with me that first Palm Sunday. As Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, no doubt there were kids like me with their palm branches laying it down at the feet of Jesus, not understanding all the political implications that mom and dad were talking about, not understanding all the geopolitical situations that they were worried about, but humbly saying, here's a leader, and they lay down those branches. 
They are an example to us of the innocence and humility and trust that we need to place before Jesus as we welcome him to be king in our life. You know, today as we leave and we see our kids coming out of kids ministry, I hope to see them running around with them palm branches. If they tickle you in, your, in the front seat uh, behind your ear as you leave today, may that childlike innocence and faith be a reminder and an example to us of how we are to approach Jesus as we contemplate the doorway to the cross. If you're feeling hopeless today and overwhelmed, Jesus is your king. Will you celebrate it? And will you look to him? The good news of the gospel is Jesus knows us completely and he still loved us. I can't think about anybody else that knows me completely and still loves me. He knows everything about you, everything about me. And he came to Hosanna to save us. So celebrate this day. Consider this doorway. And join us as we reflect together this week on the cross. Each week, uh, or, or this week, we, we were, we'll be sending out another email with daily readings for you. Now, I know some of you are already planning your big meal next Sunday, and that's the one thing on your mind. I know the way you Italian people are, okay? All right. Before you get ahead to next Sunday, don't rush through the days of this week. I want to invite you to read God's word with us. We're going to make it posted online. We're going to send it out an email again. Reflect each day on the work of Jesus as we come to celebrate and contemplate the palms, the symbol of the cross, and a week from now, the symbol of that empty tomb. Because we may be living in a Palm Sunday kind of world that wants political hope, in a Good Friday world that's overcome with despair. But we know that because of Jesus' work on that cross, we get to be children of the resurrection. And we look forward to that day. Let's pray together.